Well, good morning. Um, so we've been doing a, a study of the book of Hebrews on Sunday afternoon, but it's become so apparent to me uh, that, and so exciting and uplifting that I'm going to flip. I'm going to start teaching lessons from the book of Hebrews in the morning. Um, not to make anybody uncomfortable, but 95% of you aren't here in the afternoon. And, and you're missing out. And I want, I want you to have this because it is so exciting to look at this book of Hebrews. And the message is so uplifting. And so I, as this week as I was preparing and I had my lessons done, and then last, yesterday afternoon I went, no, I'm going to flip these lessons. Because I saw how much it's doing for me and how encouraging it has to go through this book. After 22 years of preaching, and I don't know how many times I've taught the book of Hebrews, you know, that's what I love about God's Word is how exciting it is and how much it's helped me. And so that's why I want to do this. I want to switch this over. So I'm going to have to do a little quickness on this and, and try to bring you up to where we're at, uh, where we've accomplished on Sunday afternoons and bring you up to that. And, and one of the great things about this book is it's, it's a writer. We don't know necessarily who he is. A lot of people have given credit to the Apostle Paul, but that's not really important. The important thing is, who's he writing it to? He's writing it to Christians who used to be Jews, Jewish followers of Mosaic Law. Let's be more specific. They were followers of Mosaic Law, and they accepted this man, Jesus, as a Christ that was prophesied from what they had been told since they were little bitty people. They had been hearing about it. They heard it through the prophets. If there's one thing that a Jewish little person learned as they're growing up, child, was the Psalms. And they, were, they memorized them. I did not realize how bad we are today in our society when it comes to memorizing. One, I have a terrible memory. So I'm impressed that anybody has a memory. But that's the way it was. There was no formal education, no written books. But the memorization of it was powerful to those youth. And so as they grew older, and when the time came that God brought the fulfillment of His promise and brought in the Messiah, the King, the, the King of Peace, all these words and attributes that they had heard about, they were all pointing towards this man, Jesus. And I keep saying that on purpose because his last name is, his last name is not Christ. Sometimes we, that's all we hear, right? We hear Jesus Christ. <clears throat> to all the people of that generation, he was a man who was from Nazarene that they couldn't figure out why he caused such an upheaval and that the council, the religious leaders of your nation, condemned him as a blasphemer and the Romans also then took him out and crucified him in the worst way a criminal could be killed. That's what you knew. But as they witnessed things, they saw things, they started pulling them together and then they started listening to the apostles with the power of miracles and things and like that were going on. And then they were linking the dots between what they had known to what they had knew from when they were young. And it connected and it made it. And they became a Christian. They accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, being baptized. But then time has come along. Like all of us, when we first become a Christian, we're so excited, aren't we? I have yet to see somebody come up out of the watery grave of baptism, and they're depressed. <laughs> Boy, that was a mistake. No, they're on fire. They're, they're, they're so emotional and charged. And then what happens to us? We just lose it. We just start just losing that excitement about it. And, and that's what we have here. Now, they have even more of a reason to than you and I do. Because you see, it was a theocracy. Their nation state was religion. Their inheritance, their retirement, everything about their financial well-being was around their inheritance. It's like you becoming a Christian and giving up every retirement plan that you have right now. Give it up. And that every person that you associated with, all your relatives, would never talk to you again. Period. Now, today, we don't, we're not asked that. As Christians, I mean, nobody tells us, okay, whenever they're baptized, man, you're going to give up all your, well, maybe some cults, right? <laughs> they don't do that. But that's the dedication it took for a Hebrew to say, I believe that this man, Jesus, 
is the Messiah. And they came with such enthusiasm. But something happened. Now later on, the writer talks about the fact of what happened. And we know historically that there was persecution starting to hit them. We know that the death of Stephen. We know that the scattering of the church. We start to see this happening. Martyrdom was starting to happen to them. And he reminds them that they had gone through this once. They had suffered through it. This ridicule, rejection, physical pain, financial catastrophe, stealing of their own goods. People coming in and just taking their stuff. And he said, you you held fast. You did wonderful. You did great for that. But something's happened. And they're starting to waver on it. So what does he do? He comes back with this book. And the writer is trying to confirm to them and prove to them that this man, Jesus, is not just a man. He is greater than anything you could ever imagine as a Jew. And so he starts out by talking about that he's greater than all that you have ever heard from in the past. And so that's what we're going to look at. He says that Jesus is better. He says he's superior. And he is greater than the prophets. Oh, now, now, you see. So he's got to build this up again and remind him. Now, so you're sitting there going, Ron, I'm not a Jew. So why is that so important? And what about those poor Christians that were pagans that be, be, believed and became? You know, I didn't even understand the importance of being a Jew in this letter and I'm a Gentile. We're all Gentiles. But this has been one of the most uplifting letters for me in my spiritual growth as a Christian throughout the years. I, I, this, this has made me feel so much more confident about my faith by this reading and studying this book. And so it's applicable. Because just like I started out and talked about how that we too, once we have accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, that all of a sudden what happens to us? We start to do the same thing. Life comes back and hammers you, doesn't it? And then you start to just go, and you drift. And that's one of the warnings that he's already given. And I'm not going to go all the way back and you know, go from chapter 1 all the way through because I want to come to this one because I think it is so needful for us today. Is the idea that you know, we're moving through as he goes through the prophets who God spoke through and he said they were great and they worshiped those guys literally almost. If those guys, you know, Isaiah, you know, Ezekiel, Daniel, Moses, and he's saying, no, 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 this guy's even better. And then he also proves the fact that he's a God. None of them were gods. He's greater than angels. He's greater than all these things that were so important to the Jew as he was growing up and as he was an adult. And so, and then he says, he's greater than Moses. And that's where in chapter 3, the first part, 1 through 7, that I didn't read, he points out the fact that he's greater in his office, he's greater in his work, and he's greater in who he is. Because he not only is God's son, he's the builder of the house. He built the house in which you lived in, and when he says house, he's referring to your covenant relationship with Moses and God. That was a relationship in the family of all the tribes. And he said, Jesus built that house. And he also built this house that you, that are a Christian now. Now, who is greater? The one who lives and serves in the house? The one who built the house? The one that built the house. Who is greater? The one that's called a son? Or the one who serves in the house? The one that's called son. This is Jesus. And he's got these words that link it together that keep building upon what he's been saying called therefore. So because of all of this stuff, he says, this is why you need to stay fast to that initial excitement and love of God and His Son because of what you are now participating in. And so now he moves indirectly to now going to Joshua. And how does he do this? Because he warns them that as great as he is, and you understood at one point, you understood how great he was, that now you're starting to drift away and you could possibly neglect your salvation. And also the fact that there's something even greater that you received that you can lose, and that is rest. And that's something we all can relate to. Every one of us at some point. 
I remember when I was a lieutenant in the army and we went out with play army and we'd do all these maneuvers and stuff. And, and as a lieutenant, I would get maybe 30, 40 minutes of sleep a night. And one night, finally, about two weeks into the exercise, my platoon sergeant said, Lieutenant Heron, you got to lay down. Well, I did. And all of a sudden, I have this dream that somebody is talking to me. And I'm laying in my sleeping bag and I'm looking up at the sky and he's talking to me and he's saying, Lieutenant, we got to go. We got to move. And I'm just, and I would not move. He said I was catatonic. I would just, and I just remember kind of going, Who are you? I didn't even recognize him. I was so exhausted. And physically, I was becoming sick because I wouldn't get enough rest. We can appreciate that. We know that physically, the studies have been proven. Our bodies have to shut down. We have to have this rest. And we all have had good night's rest, and we've had some bad ones. And so it's no, no accident that this is trying to show us a spiritual application of this type of a rest. And so he's going to shadow a couple of real ideas, but help the Hebrew to see the importance of what happened historically. What happened in the past. And that's what I read to you this morning, was the idea of saying, you recall this historically, guys. Remember this story? When our ancestors came out of Egypt, out of slavery, what happened to them? He says because of their lack of belief, not their lack of hearing, they heard it. And if you go back and read historically, when Moses read the law to them and gave them the blessings and the curses, they said, we take the blessings. Amen. We're with you. They heard it. But something happened when they went to enter that land of promise, that they would finally be set free from the slavery and making and, and serving the Egyptians to owning the land and being free. And they didn't get it. And it was like they were provoking God constantly. How many times you have to recall the Red Sea being parted? Weren't you there? That, that's what I would almost want to say. Did you not see the wall of water around us that we walked through? Did you not see all the things that he did to the nation and destroyed the most powerful nation that was alive in existence at that time? How much does God have to demonstrate to you that he is your God and that he's there for you? And he will always be there for you. But we as well can fall short of that rest. And so I always hear Christians struggling with that. And I know I have. Where is this rest? What is this, you know? Because he offers it. He says there's this rest. Have you had it? Have you had it? I mean, I think, you know, okay, I'm going to get kind of crazy, but <laughs> I used to think of mattress commercials <laughs> when I would think of this. And, you know, you ever go and test mattresses, you know, and you sit there and go, oh, you know, and you think about how you could just, oh, what a great rest. Spiritually, I think we're all looking for that. And, and we hear it. We hear about how he's the king of peace, that he came to bring peace. But we hear conflicting stories. Well, no, I did not come to bring peace, but I came to bring the sword. And then so we're like, well, maybe I'm missing the point here. Maybe there's something wrong with me. Why am I not able to get this peace, this rest? And then we hear Paul talk about this peace in Philippians, about how that there's this peace that surpasses understanding. You're right, Paul. Not only does it surpass understanding, it surpassed me completely. And then the Hebrew writer sits there and goes, an entire nation basically died in the wilderness because why? He says they had a hard heart, and it wasn't because of a lack of evidence and facts. It was because of their belief, their disbelief. So this is something that in that rest, there's some points in it that I think that I want to bring out before we'll go ahead and drive on in this lesson and parse this out some more. Some aspects that we need to look at when we say, what is this rest? Because again, it's like many things. It's not what you can imagine in a physical way. And that's where some people get disappointed because that's what they want, because that's what they feel they need. But this rest, first and foremost, was a peace between you and your Creator. 
that is inside every one of us, whether they accept it or not, whether the atheists or not, rebels against God. It doesn't matter. They sear their conscience. They have to burn their conscience to get rid of that thought. But it's there. Why do you think that every human that walks wants to worship something? Why do you think that almost every culture we've ever dug up has a sacrifice? They have priests. I've been listening to the history of the Greeks, and I'm just blown away at the parallels between the Greek gods and the real God. Because every one of us knows that there is the one God. Now, what do you want to see in that God, see? And that's where these idols come up. And that's where they fail to find the rest. But even in that worship and the superstitions that they're trying to exercise, they're seeking a rest. They're seeking peace with their gods. The Greeks were seeking peace with their gods because they would destroy their crops. They would kill people. They would have misfortunes. They wanted peace. So is that the peace? No. The peace with God is that He is your Father. And that you have reestablished that relationship. You've had an estranged relationship before? Where every time you thought about it, and once it was restored, how beautiful it was? How wonderful it was to know that you'd restored that. I have. I know you have. And that's the first part of how restful it becomes. The next one is freedom from slavery. When he's talking to the Hebrews, he's reminding them of the slavery that came out of Egypt. God set you free. And all you did is provoke him, reject him, and then he destroyed you all except for the two. He was going to set you free. He was going to put you into that land in homes He tells them that you did not build, vineyards that you did not plant, wells that you did not dig, you're going to get them. I'm not putting you on an empty lot and saying, okay, there's your property, build it. No, it was going to be beautiful. And the spies came out and they said, yep, it's exactly what He wanted, exactly what He promised. And coupled with all those facts that He told them and that they witnessed themselves, they still failed to enter the land. Powerful lesson for a Hebrew listening to this. Powerful lesson for us today. How quick we forget, right? There was another part of this freedom that he's talking about, that this rest that they're going to get is a freedom from the law. The Mosaic law could not save anybody. It was burdensome. It was a part of the civil law. Everything that they did was around you know, the law. That's why Paul spends so much effort and energy convincing them that you don't want to be a part of the law. And now, so you say, well, Ron, we don't have mosaic problems and law issues. It's not like I have to pick between that. No, but you understand the burden of having the law hanging over you. You've heard that. And subconsciously, we know that. Most of us, like I always say, you know, there's a lot of civil laws that we have thousands of them that you don't even think about, do you? I don't wake up and go, man, i got to watch that murder law. Whew. I, I just want to kill people. I have a habit of killing people. I mean, or I rob people all the time. The law is so burdened. I don't, I don't think of that. Why? Because I'm at peace with it. I'm at peace. We achieve this peace because we are also set free from that. Why? Because we are at peace with God. The greatest one that he refers to in here and he indicates is it's not just any rest. This is the rest, he says, that God has. You say, whoa, wait a minute. You know, that's why he says that we're, we're heirs. We're, we're inheritors of the same. Now, he hasn't stopped. God's not on vacation. Rest doesn't mean that you don't have to work. Being a Christian doesn't mean that you just sit back and coast in. But there is a rest. There's a confidence in there. And that rest. And it was set up in a way in the week that we had. The way they had set it up was six days of creation, right? From the very beginning. And on the seventh day, God rests. That was a teaching point. That was a shadowing. Pointing to the forward. And then He made it law. You're going to take that day and you're going to rest. And it was to help see and show that there reaches a point when the works are completed, when there's a shadow. See, there's that, that real part where he's talking about the fact that we're going to leave this world and everything here is going to be done and stopped. 
And we're going to go somewhere. You're not going to stop it. Nobody's getting out of this world alive. So, how is it going to be? Is it going to be a rest for you? So he warns them about how they had failed again. And I want to bring that up. And he said that I swore in my wrath and my anger that they weren't going to enter it. And then he turns around and reminds them of how to help prevent that was to exhort one another. Exhort. Encourage. We don't use that word. We don't walk around and say, man, Bob showed up and he exhorted me really good and I feel better. Some of these words we don't use, right? How do we encourage one another? He says, use that as opportunities to encourage one another so that we don't drift away. We don't fall into the same condition as those who failed to enter the left. Unbelief. Not lack of hearing. Not a lack of hearing. And so he says, in the same way that when they heard this message, don't harden your heart. How do you harden it? You know, if you think about something that's hard, it can't absorb, it can't function. You know, it's something that's, you know, especially when it has to do with the real heart. We harden it by failing to accept. And you know, that's the other thing when we talk about faith. Faith is not just an acceptance of facts. Faith is not just saying, well, okay, I accept those, those facts. It's reliance in those words. Faith. Paul says, and I say this all the time because it's so important, faith comes by hearing God's Word. And it's not just saying, okay, I accept those facts. Because then Abraham would have never done anything. He would have stayed back in his original land. Moses would have never gone back and tried to get the people out if it was just accepting facts. It takes a part of that. And so that was where they failed. They heard it. They accepted it but then they rejected it. And that was a condition, he says, is hard-hearted. Now, we come to four. And this is where he really starts to show the beauty of this idea. And so let's go ahead. Open up your Bibles. There's some, some in the pew, put, pew in front of you if you don't have one with you. And starting in four. So now he's talked about how Joshua failed to bring them in to this rest. Do you know what why Moses didn't get to go into the promised land? You remember that? Well, I remember. Absolutely. He sinned. Yeah, that, that's right. And somehow, we look at that as such a severe punishment. Yeah, in a way. But have you ever thought about what Joshua had to go through with those people? And he had already gone through it for 40 years. But there's a shadow here as well that is so important that I have missed forever. Moses couldn't go to the promised land because of what God was trying to show and to teach. Moses was the old law. That's what he was. That's what they saw him. When Jesus arrived, that's when this would become an important teaching point. To them, Moses, law, law, Moses. The man, Moses, law, law. That's it, Moses. But Joshua. You know how you have different names? Like, you know, my name is, legal name is Ronald. My family, I grew up, they call me Ronnie. My friends now and other people call me Ron. But it's Ronald. There's different ways of it. Do you know what Jesus' name was? Well, you just said it, Ron. Joshua. Joshua. And Joshua's name was another form of saying Jesus. Who led them into the land? Took them and delivered them over into the land of promise. Jesus. Joshua. This is one of the most beautiful things that when we start to look at that, and I'm not saying, I, I, I know I'm showing a symbolic side of this, but there's a powerful lesson. The only way they were going to obtain this rest was not with Moses. It was going to be with Jesus, Joshua. And Joshua took them in. And what happened to them when they got into that land? Did it go well for them? Not really. So even with Joshua, Jesus, his other part of his name, bringing them into that physical land, 
they still failed time and time again, didn't they? So even Joshua, let's call him Jesus, the physical one from hundreds of years previous, failed to really provide them this rest. But there's now this Joshua, Jesus, who can do it. He can give you that final rest. So we're going to read down to about verse 11. So now that's where he's going to bring this in. Therefore, while the promise of entering his rest still stands, see, there's, there's something coming, he says. Let us fear lest any of you should seem to have failed to reach it. For good news came to us just as them, but the message they heard did not benefit them because they were not united by faith with those who listened. For we who have believed enter that rest, as he has said, as I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Along with his works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he has somewhere spoken of the seventh day in this way. And God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And again, in this passage, he said, They shall not enter my rest. Since therefore it remains for some to enter it, and those who formerly received the good news failed to enter because of their disobedience, again he appoints a certain day. Today, says David, so long afterwards, in the words already quoted, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken of another day later on. So then, there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works as God did from his therefore let us strive to enter that rest so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience for the word of god is active sharper than any two-edged sword piercing to the division of soul and of spirit and of joints and marrow and discerning the thoughts and the intentions of the heart and no creature is hidden from his sight but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account Notice how many times he's, by the way, he's quoting Psalms 95. That's what David wrote. And what I thought was amazing is how the first part of that psalm is about worship and the magnificence of God and glorifying God and singing praises to God. And then all of a sudden, the second part of that Psalm 95 stops and he goes, don't harden your heart. It's like, whoa, where that? David, you took a turn on that psalm, didn't you? Because that's what happens. One moment we think God is wonderful and beautiful and we, we glorify Him and then all of a sudden we just become dull. We just kind of harden our hearts away from Him. So he says there's still a day telling the Hebrew writers, yes, we know that day there. We know Joshua wasn't able to provide it for him. That's why there's a talk of another day. And you notice how many times, 13 times, he uses rest. You notice how many times he keeps quoting. And I, and I love that, the way he says that. You know, as we're already, he's, he's doing it to textual teaching it's as if he's read the book psalms like i'm doing right now he's in psalms 95 they didn't have the numbers and now he's applying it and he keeps going to it that's what he's doing when he says and again when it says today today and by the way that is active present it's not in past tense so in other words it's something he's constantly saying that is real and applicable forward from this point forward and by the way tomorrow is the devil's day today is the day the lord made for us today is the only day you have if you finish the day out i mean there's always that unfortunate act right but that's what satan wants he wants you to look at tomorrow we'll all start going to church more tomorrow tomorrow and i think that's one of the parts where god and what he keeps saying is what? Today, 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 right now, while you're reading this letter, right now, while you're listening to this lesson, don't fall asleep. <laughs> Not because I want you to listen to me because I'm so entertaining. No, because God said it's important. Your salvation is dependent upon it. And the danger is you'll develop an unbelieving heart and you're going to fail to enter that rest that you want so bad. So don't give it up. You know, 
one of the most conflicted characters in music when I was growing up and as I learned about him was Elvis Presley. When he sung those gospel, and if you get a chance, if you haven't heard any of his gospel music, and I'm not endorsing instrumental music and stuff, but he has done some a cappella music. He was raised spiritual, didn't live a very godly life per se, but it was inside him. Three months before he died, he performed his last concert. And that night, he wasn't in good health by then either. When he went up into his hotel room and everybody left, he picked up a pen and he wrote a prayer on a piece of paper. One of his handlers found it. Later, kept it. You pick up everything that a famous person does, right? Right now, well, I don't know if he's still, but it was hanging in, um, oh, I just lost his name, Newton. What's his name? Um, <laughs> but, huh? Wade Newton. And he has it framed on his wall in his house. After he died, after Elvis died, he gave they gave that to him, and he wrote a song about that little, and it's short. And Wayne Newton said every time he walks by and he looks at it, he said he almost cries because he knows how he felt because of what he expressed. And I think it expresses it for all of us when it comes spiritually. Look what he says. I feel so alone sometimes. The night is, is quiet for me. I'd love to be able to sleep. I am glad that everybody is gone now. Lord, help me. That was it. You, if you, you've been around people that are famous, and he couldn't sleep. That was one of his problems. So whether you're following God or not, we're seeking it, aren't we? And so we're still searching for that rest. And that's why I brought the illustration of even this man who was so worldly, that was so famous, that had jets and cars and buying Cadillacs for people and giving them away. So no matter where you're at in life, no matter how little you have or how much you have, we suffer the same desire. That we're not able to find that rest. And God is doing everything He can to help you keep going forward to find that final rest. And so that's why he says, while that promise still remains. You see, there's going to be a point where it's not going to remain any longer. Now whether the Lord comes again, or you die. If you haven't achieved it, it's not a, it's not a, you know, a mulligan like in golf. You don't get a redo. You're either going to have it or not. So why would you jeopardize it, right? So the key to the failure here, going back, what I read, and I underlined those, I'm not going to go back and read it, but look at the key things he says. He says, they heard, yet rebelled. But wait a minute, I, was, I read that historical account, and, and everybody just unanimously shouted out. They were so motivated and said, we'll do it, man, we want it. We, wait a minute, but he says here, he says, they heard it, yet they rebelled. So there's a period of time in between here when they first herded it. Herded it? Sounds like I'm a cowboy herding cows or something. Sorry about that. <laughs> when they first heard it, and then they rebelled. Now, most Christians who stop coming to church, like I've said before, they don't wake up one morning and say, that's it, I'm done. No more church for me. How does it happen? It's a drifting. Most Christians don't wake up in the morning and say, I'm rebelling. That's it. I'm rebelling against God. I mean, you got the guts to even say that out loud? Most people don't. But they don't realize that's what they're doing. You see, the other thing is that those 40 years that those people were going through, God was still giving them food every day. God was keeping their clothes from decaying. They never had to go to a Walmart again for clothes. Okay, they didn't have Walmarts. He was still taking care of them. And it's almost as if they were thumping him in the chest and provoking him. All the way out with that slave mindset. 
All the things they had seen God do. It was like that little kid, that little brat, getting up in God's face and thumping him, thumping him, thumping him. Wasn't there enough graves back in Egypt? Wasn't there enough meat back in Egypt? Why are we out here in the heat? Why do we keep doing this? We need water. We need this. We need that. You understand why then God said, you know what? They provoked me. That's what we do. Now, God didn't show up every time and say, little Johnny, you're provoking me. He didn't have to. He didn't show up every day and say that to them and remind them, by the way, you're rebelling. By the way, you're provoking. You're provoking. So when we say, well, I don't rebel. (laughs) I'm not provoking God. Yes, we do. We do. If you love me, Jesus said, you'll obey my commands. And they're not burdensome. And what I have to share with you will bring you into this great rest. But when you don't go to church, when you don't show up to attendance, you're provoking. Whoa, whoa, wait a minute. Is church about attendance? No, it's not. You're, no one's going to get saved because they go to church. I'm going to say that. You're saved by faith. You're saved by grace. But let's go back to those two great commands. Love God with all your heart and all your soul. And the next one is equal to it, is to love others as you love yourself. And if you love God with all your heart and truly all your soul, one, you're not going to rebel, you're not going to have a hard heart, and you're going to want to please Him. And one of the things He does is He tells us things to do to make us survive and be built up spiritually and not become the example He gave us. To avoid that. How does He do that? He says, come together and be with Christians. Be with those who love Me. Why are you with those people who love, don't love Me? What are they going to do for you? (laughs) You think they've got rest? Then why do you stay at home? Now, I understand, you know, we have a pandemic and it has magnified it, but this has always been a problem. It really has. And it's become a mantra, in a sense, in society and saying, well, we don't need to go to church. I don't need a church to get to heaven. And I have to say, you are right. But I need God. And God says, I need you. I may not like you, but I love you. And I'm coming here for Him. And then through that, I start to grow up. (laughs) And I start to realize how much you mean to me. Even though we may not like each other, I realize how much I love you. And this type of love is so powerful. It helps to propel us into this peace with God first and then one another. And once we can start doing that, you're going to look at your life all the way around and you're going to see yourself being set free from all the stress and the strain and the fighting and the anger and the hatred that's raging around us. Because our God is alive and in charge. And He's offered me something far greater than what anybody will ever be able to bring to the table and try to say, Ron, I got something. No, you don't. No, you don't. No, they don't. No Christian says they don't believe. Even Christians who go to church don't say they don't believe. Most of the Hebrews who were wandering and dropping dead in the wilderness did not say they did not believe there was a God. What they didn't do was put their trust in Him. What they didn't do is follow through. They just attach themselves and think that somehow they were going to get carried through with their genealogy. Somehow they'd be able to write the coattails of everybody else. Does that sound familiar today? It happens all the time, whether it's in the church or not. But God says spiritually that won't work. You will never enter the rest. Oh, you may continue to go to church. You may continue to think you're doing well. But Jesus says in Matthew chapter 7, 21, what does He say about people that do that? <laughs> They're going to wake up on Judgment Day and He's going to say, uh, who are you, Ron? Who are you? 
Whoa, I'm the one that preached 22 years. I'm the one that baptized this. I'm the one that did all these podcasts. I'm the one that did all that. He goes, huh? I'm sorry, I, I don't have a relationship with you. Whoa, wait a minute. I use your name all the time. Yeah, but you hardened your heart and you really weren't following what I wanted. You were following, Ron, what you wanted. I don't want anyone to lose an opportunity for this glorious rest that we need and we live every day desiring and wanting. He has this rest and He's offering it to us all the time. We have to really think about the way we've been living. And that's why I'm telling you, today is the day. Do not harden your heart to this message. It's because I poked you and said something about your attendance or something like that. If it's going to save your soul, then I'm going to poke you. If it's going to get you into that eternal rest, I will poke you. I will provoke you if it's going to help save you. Because that's what God has been trying to do for all of us. You want that rest? I know you do. If you haven't been living a life that God would be pleased with, if you've been living that life provoking God, now is the time to turn to Him. Not me. Turn to Him. Change while you have a chance to change. We don't know how much time we have. If you have not entered to that rest initially and brought about that peace, that freedom from the slavery of sin, all those initial things by being baptized, and not just saying I believe the evidence, that I have faith in the evidence, but you act upon it like we see happened in the book of Acts. When people heard it, they believed in the facts and they acted upon it. And when they asked, what do we have to do? They wanted to know, what is the action now that I have accepted the evidence? And time and time again, whether we have it recorded or not, the action that they performed, that they must have been told to do, was what? Baptism. Call it what you want. Some people say, oh, well, Ron, that's a work. Ron, is that? Call it what you want. But historically, I will show you time and time again that when they were told about this beautiful Savior who came to this earth, who sacrificed His life, who died and was buried and raised again, when they heard that and realized that they were wrong with God, their action was baptism. If you have not done that, I beseech you, I beg you, I implore you, Start that restful journey now. And it's attainable. It's obtainable. But it isn't going to be by riding on the coattails of a church. It's going to be you working. If there's something we can do to help you in that achieving of rest, let us know. And if you're comfortable, come forward while we stand and we sing the invitation song.